one action to protest the Vietnam War. This university can't be intimidated by terrorists. Shatter UW-Madison. Nobody's really sure what's going to really go on right now. Tonight, meet the survivors of Sterling Hall. There should be no way that I'm here today speaking to you. I should be dead. And the bombers who changed the course of Wisconsin's progressive fight. It really uh, set the anti-war movement back. What it took to rebuild. It was pretty obvious that for the next few years, things would be difficult. And the parallels to our current climate. History can repeat itself. Our state, our history. The bombing of Sterling Hall. A WKOW special presentation. Thank you for joining us. I'm Amber Noggle. And I'm Jennifer Cleasy. Tonight, we remember an historic moment in Wisconsin history. For decades, the bombing of Sterling Hall was known as the worst act of domestic terrorism in the U.S. We've got what appears to be the beginnings of an outright revolution. That moment 50 years ago today devastated the Madison community and the anti-war movement. Tonight, we'll highlight how the Vietnam War era influenced Madison and how that atmosphere of protest resonates today. First, we take a look at what happened in the bombing of Sterling Hall. Throughout 1970, anti-war protests consumed the UW-Madison campus. And up till then, Things have been pretty violent and unstable. As the Vietnam War went on, violence across the U.S. lit a fire for demonstrators in Madison, opposing anything war-related. As it got to be violent, I think most of us were grad students stayed away. Jay Gallagher and his colleagues felt the threat, working just a few floors above the Army Math Research Center, which many wanted off campus. In astronomy, we're pretty sure the building was going to be bombed. The summer, the New Year's gang were formulating their their plot to bomb Sterling Hall. At 3.40 a.m. on August 24th, four men loaded a van with explosives and lit the fuse, <laughs> aiming to destroy the military-funded center. Throughout the city, people heard the blast. Um, it was the equivalent of 2,000 sticks of dynamite. One man was killed, four others hurt. The UW Board of Regents today pledged a $100,000 reward for any information which leads to the conviction of those who bombed the Army Mathematics Research Center. This irrational act must be countered with a renewed sense of community involvement. UW Archives researcher Troy Reeves says word of the bombing spread around the world as UW-Madison became an infamous site of terrorism. It was the worst act of domestic terrorism until the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. An act that changed the tide of the protest movement. Everybody realized when you start blowing up buildings, people are going to get killed. There was a pretty deep understanding that this was way out of line. Gallagher found out about the explosion as he was about to get married. And so the explosion was right in this area. One of the many lucky to have been out of the office. If I'd been in there, the window blew in and embedded in the blackboard, so I would have been but one of the many on campus left with the pain of an anti-war action gone wrong. We as an institution survived it, the department survived it, although at the time it looked pretty grim. The man whose life was taken by this tragedy was in his final hours at the university. 33-year-old Robert Fosnacht was a physics researcher working overnight in his basement lab to finish a project. In 2010, Frank Scarpace told UW's oral history project he had helped Fosnacht that night, leaving just hours before the explosion. This is such a, such a, such a blow and so ironic. Bob was really a, a pretty much, in fact, most of us at that time were pretty much anti-war. He had an army cot. He was going to sleep there overnight while it, while it warmed up to room temperature. And then the bomb went off and not of the bombing. Former physics colleague John Wiley says Fosnacht and his family were planning to leave town the next day for a new job in California. One man who survived was a graduate student working an overnight shift. AJ Bypour talked with David Schuster about his recollections of that night, as well as some of the firefighters who responded that early morning. All kinds of peaceful discussion. Watching protesters demonstrate at Sterling Hall, David Schuster, then a graduate physics student from South Africa, wondered why the Army Math Research Center was there to begin with. I didn't understand why there should be an army center on a university campus. It didn't seem to be in the core mission of the university. Still, 
Schuster says he never thought protesters would attack the building. Never gave it any thought, whatever. Schuster was working overnight, monitoring the accelerator around 3 a.m. that August morning. What is the very last thing you remember before the blast? It's one of the things that's hardest. Um, I'd have to say seeing Robert Fosner in the hallway. For Madison Firefighter Station nearby, the response came before the alarm. The explosion went off and rocked the building. We got up, started getting dressed. We knew we were going somewhere. We didn't know where at the time. Both John Kammer and Paul Locken have since retired from the Madison Fire Department. They now live next to each other near Blanchardville in Greene County. Hard to uh, comprehend how much damage was done to that building. I remember him bringing somebody out to the ambulance. And at the time, it was Professor Fosnott, I found out later. Schuster, meanwhile, was regaining consciousness in the dark. So I called out. The flashlights were the helmet lights on top of their uh, helmets. Um, as soon as I called out, I got a response, and they said, keep talking. Schuster says he believes what saved his life was that he just happened to be standing behind one of the building's support beams at the time of the blast. I was injured, certainly. Um, but um, if not for that, if I'd been a little bit one way or the other, um, I'd have been killed instantly. As he looks at protests both then and today, Schuster says he sees movements that may have hurt their cause with violence, but he adds passive protests are often ineffective. It just seems to be a perpetual cycle. So what does, here's the question, what does cause change in the end? It's a question the professor is still trying to answer. In Madison, I'm A.J. Bayatpour. The men convicted of bombing Sterling Hall always said they didn't mean to hurt anyone, but they ran, and investigators worked to track them down and bring them to justice. Tony Galley tells us how all but one of the bombers have been held accountable. Anti-Vietnam War protesters on the UW-Madison campus in the late 60s drew the attention of police. They, they went to every damn rally there was. They knew everybody from um, uh, every radical group. Um, nobody knew these guys. Carlton Armstrong, Dwight Armstrong, David Fine, Leo Burt. Authorities say they used a truck bomb to obliterate Sterling Hall. Their target the Army Math Research Center and its connection to the war effort. Their victim, physics researcher Robert Fosnock. Did they set out to kill somebody? No, I don't think so. Did they set out to blow that building up and if somebody died, well, that's just the price you pay. That's what happened. Carl Armstrong spoke about it in a 1979 documentary. And I felt morally a sense of shame for taking someone's life. I didn't feel it was justified. Mike Zaleski prosecuted Carl Armstrong. I believe I asked him if, on cross-examination, if you had to do this all over again, would you do it? And he said, yes. We don't want to fight anymore, but if we have to fight again, it'll be to take these steps. After a half century, there are still strong feelings about the men authorities say were responsible for the explosion, destruction, and the death here at Sterling Hall. And after 50 years, there is still an effort to locate and prosecute Leo Burt. Both Armstrongs and David Fine did prison time. Leo Burt, Burt was pretty smart, has not been found. Every year, I went through every piece of evidence. Former U.S. Attorney John Vaudry was ready to prosecute Burt. The system of justice, you don't give up just because the person has evaded you for all these years. Sterling Hall stands without traces of that domestic terrorism. Yet, authorities say the actions of four misguided anti-war protesters remain as relevant in 2020 as they were in 1970. In Madison, Tony Galley. After the bombing, Wisconsin's progressive push for change during the Vietnam era lost steam as FBI and police presence grew in Madison. Former Mayor Paul Soglin was a city council member at the time. He was a leader in the movement for years and saw rallies get smaller, losing the spirit of the protests amid fears of violence. The bombing not only took Robert Fosnock's life, but in a way it sucked the life out of, of the anti-war movement. And the war ended on Richard Nixon's terms. 
Soglin says the city government was conflicted about how to respond. He says the attack at UW was felt across the country as the war continued overseas. Rebuilding UW, coming up, how the university overcame the devastating attack and why it was so difficult for many. I drove by not knowing, you know, what was going on. Plus, when we come back, UW alumni share what it was like to return to uncertainty on campus after the bombing. Some people really want to keep school going, are anxious to uh, have a good year, but by and large, everything's kind of up in the air. Despite the tragedy, just a short time before, students returned to campus for the fall semester in 1970. But it was a much different place than they left in spring. Caroline Bach caught up with people who were part of the campus community at the time about what kind of impact the bombing left on them. I turned on to University Avenue at about 7 in the morning. Linda Pluchak was driving through campus to get to an internship the morning of August 24th, 1970. There was smoke everywhere and there were fire engines everywhere. She was a graduate student in the School of Education at the time. And it was just an absolute mess and I had no idea what was going on. Information was just trickling in, and so we weren't really sure what all had happened yet. Robert Wilson was a brand new member of UW's faculty in the math department, his office not far from the bombing. The bombing had taken out all but one of my windows, had uh, bent the metal frames of the windows so that they couldn't just put glass back in. You know, not everyone when they're starting their faculty experience at a university has something like this happen. What kind of an impact did that leave on your career? We really did take a while to, um, to internalize what a big thing this was, I think. Once students and staff returned, word of what had happened began to spread. That's all that was on the news was the Sterling Hall bombing, and it looked absolutely horrific. An uneasy calm would probably best describe the mood here at the University of Wisconsin on this first day of the new school year. And what was already a tense wartime atmosphere amplified. There was just a lot of stress on campus. There was a lot going on and a, a lot of tension and a lot of feelings. But as time went on, so did life. I don't want to downplay the tragedy of it. But, you know, you've got to live your life and get on with other things, and uh, that's what we had to do. I really think ultimately it didn't really change anything very much for good or ill, which is so unfortunate to the people that were intimately involved. Reporting in Madison, I'm Caroline Bach. According to the UW-Madison archives, insurance estimates put damage on campus at between two and a half to five million dollars in 1970. Windows and offices of buildings near Sterling Hall were also damaged in the blast. It was viewed as, as not a high point in the history. Still ahead, the bombing had an impact far beyond damage and death. How UW careers were hurt long after the explosion. And later, we'll hear from experts on how violence after peaceful protests impacts the goals of a movement. Those who lived through the bombing on campus say it was something many didn't want to talk about. We sat down with two men who tell us how their departments overcame the loss and moved forward. I think about it every time I drive by Sterling. 50 years later, John Wiley and Jay Gallagher are still struck by how close they came to tragedy. If I would have opened my window, I could have touched their tires on their truck. This was a very, very powerful blast, and it's, it's, it, it is really amazing that the building survived it. The former students were out of town when Sterling Hall was bombed, but quickly saw the damage went far beyond the building and the death of colleague Robert Fosnacht. It really affected, I think, the graduate program for probably better part of a decade to recover. Years of research across departments lost in seconds. For some, it was too painful to start over. People just wanted to forget about it and move on. 
It was nothing they were proud of, nothing they accomplished. They were just victims. Gallagher returned in fall to finish his PhD in astronomy. Protests had cooled, but Sterling Hall was still rubble. It was almost impossible to work on your thesis. I mean, the place was a wreck. He took us inside present day Sterling Hall. And you can see it still has the old style. Visiting the basement labs now rebuilt, a stark contrast to his photos from 1970. These were the kind of labs that John Wiley was in, and that Fausnock was in, and so on. So these were just gone. These were just gone. This, this whole area, so these it just was rubble and pillars. As an emeritus professor, Gallagher's office is still in Sterling, a daily reminder of what he and his colleagues overcame. There was nothing you could do about it. So you had to find a way to go forward on your career path as if it hadn't happened. But for years, the memory of the bombing impacted their futures. Just being of or from Wisconsin had a stink to it after that. Yes. We're guilty by association, not of the bombing, but of being radical. Now, after successful careers in their fields, it's a more distant memory, though one Gallagher and Wiley will never forget. I show visitors the brickwork and explain that we went through this. It's also a lesson that you can get past these things. It took decades, but the university did eventually create a remembrance of the bombing on campus. In 2007, then Chancellor John Wiley and the physics department held a ceremony to unveil a plaque at Sterling Hall commemorating the bombing and Robert Fosnock's death. The physics chair at the time, Susan Coppersmith, says it was a difficult process for the department, still healing years later. That was why people didn't want to face it for so long, I think, is because it was so painful and so traumatic for so many people, but in different ways where they couldn't even, they couldn't share their pain. Coppersmith now holds a professorship position at UW. She chose to name after Robert Fosnacht as she continues physics work he started 50 years ago. Archiving history, how the university worked to tell the story of the bombing of Sterling Hall to future generations. Plus, peaceful protests turning into unrest in the streets of Madison. How demonstrators of the past feel the UW attack impacted their movement and the parallels to today. Many say the violence of the bombing undermined demonstrations against the Vietnam War. Anti-war protesters had been building on the civil rights movement, peacefully pushing for change. But 1970 was a year of escalating tensions across the U.S., including the shooting at Kent State. In Madison, people were coming from out of town to join the unrest. This kind of violence and what starts out with the trashings and the fire bombings is so counterproductive. It's not only destructive to human lives, but it's destructive to the long-term objective of a better, more just society. Former protest leader Paul Soglin says the violence led to a setback in progress on many issues for decades. Those who were around in 1970 see similarities between that era and the environment today. In 1970, anger drove people to storm and loot businesses on State Street. Fifty years later, unrest came after Black Lives Matter protests this summer, damaging windows of those same shops today. The fight for change is a journey millions have taken on for many different reasons. Sarah Master Donar talked with experts about protest action and what it can accomplish. Protests, a familiar scene in modern times. So at the end of the day, protest is a process to demonstrate and to advocate for change and to agitate for change. Casey Lucini Butcher, a UW public historian, says Madison and UW have a long, rich history of protest action. From campus demonstrations against the Vietnam War in the late 60s to marching for racial justice in 2020. When students learn about injustice and inequality, they begin to look for it in their own communities. Lucini Butler says fighting for change can be frustrating, especially if it feels like those in power aren't listening or if they push back hard. For instance, the Dow Chemical sit of 1967, UW administrators called in Madison police to help break them up, and they did with clubs swinging. The later part of the 1960s and then early 1970 were also marked by aggression. I certainly can assure all of you that my determination to protect the rights of all of the citizens and the right of dissent will be protected. But at the same time, 
I will continue to do everything in my power to promote law and order and protect the lives and property of all of our citizens. Madison College history instructor Jonathan Pollock says historically strong media images of protests or riots do catch attention. People are going to stop what they're doing and they're going to go, what? And they're going to watch. But without context, they can result in a negative reaction, which he says may hurt the cause. The context was sort of complicated. You know, the con that it's hard to really understand what was going on there if you weren't paying attention for the several years leading up to uh, the more confrontational protests. In the end, maybe they don't accomplish the immediate goal, but historians say protest movements can leave a lasting legacy. How has these protests changed the conversation? How has it materially changed the experiences? Reporting in Madison, I'm Sarah Massler Donar. Forty years after Sterling Hall, the university decided to document the bombing. In 2010, UW Archives launched an oral history project. I remember going down and looking up there at that big hole in the wall and just, I mean, like everyone else, we thought it was a terrible thing. We quickly gathered um, that this had to do with the war, that this was a, a war protest. Nearly 100 people came to the Memorial Library to share their memories. Archivist Troy Reeves put it all together. We really start to reflect upon life and our lived experience and, and sort of the historical events that we were a part of. Uh, so I think it was a really a good time to do that. Reeves says the story booth brought out a lot of emotions, helping them reflect and move forward from a tough experience. And now, while the community looks back on the 50 years during the pandemic, the university has not scheduled any memorial events. But those impacted say they will be remembering the tragedy as they look to what's going on in our community today. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.